and say, this is my Bible. This is my Bible. I am what it says I am. I am what it says I am. I have what it says I have. I have what it says I have. And I can do what the Bible says I can do. I can do what the Bible says I can do. They all be taught the Word of God. They all be taught the Word of God. I boldly confess. I boldly confess. My mind is alert. My mind is alert. My heart is receptive. My heart is receptive. And I'll never be the same again. I'll never be the same again. Never, 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 never. Jesus if you would, turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. And while you're looking for that, how many people realize that we have an election coming up? Ooh. Has anybody seen the ballot of who is up for the election? Have you seen what your ballot's going to look like? He's been handing these, of course, these, these are marked all day with rubber bows, so I don't want to necessarily hand these out. <laughs> yeah. But if anybody's wondering, you know, we, we do want to make that available. Then while she's handing those out, John, put up that deal on the screen here. This is a very, by the way, Michael Smith asked me last week, he goes, so who's the church supporting? He's like, you know, the church isn't necessarily supporting or endorsing anybody. Okay? I mean, personally, these are some ones that we've looked at and seen, and this is an Oklahoma Liberty ticket. So if you're interested in making your task maybe a little easier when you go to vote, these are definitely some people who, when you go to this website, uh, which I'll give it to you, it's called Make oklahomafree.com okay it has things that they believe their, their voting record that type of thing and uh, so you can look at that and then if you would like to maybe share with friends or something in, in your area you can go to uh, voter portal B O T E R P O R T A L. And if you go there, it'll take you to a place where you can see this kind of thing and pull up your ballot beforehand. That way you've got a little time to research it. How many of you, because I know I have, and you'll have great, and what happens to me sometimes, I'll get there at the voting booth and I'm like, I don't know who some of these people are. Never heard of them before, so I just kind of sing in the spirit and trust God. <laughs> but you know that's uh, but this is just some you know examples of that. If you guys want to check that out, all right. So is everybody in First Kings yep. chapter nineteen? We're going to talk a little bit about Elijah this morning. I was talking to. D and Pastor Marcella last week a little bit about him. Now, you remember when Elisha or, or Elijah selected Elisha because God told him to? And it, it always seemed to me like Elijah was a little man. To him. Did, you, you ever notice that? Because like when he, in chapter 19, well, let me just start at the first one. I'll get there. These told me to slow down a little bit on, you know, turning to the scriptures a lot of times because she's like, well, you're talking, and by the time I haven't found the scripture yet, so did you like slow it down a little bit? So I'm trying different things. So I feel like I'm stumbling through it. That's usually what happens when you try new things. So, okay, at first one, everybody should be the first game is 19, though, right? Hey, it's one of them. And they had told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and with all how he had slain the prophets with the sword. And then Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that 
he arose and went for his life and came to Beersheba, where, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree. And he requested himself that he might die. And said, well, you know, really, think about this. If he really wanted to die, why did he, why did he leave? I mean, there's no promise that she's not going to kill him. Right? Right. So if he really wanted to die, wouldn't he just stay where he was at? So he wasn't really wanting to die, was he? He was just wanting to have a little bit of a picket party. Have a couple of people feel sorry for him, and, you know. But I'm not even sure who he's going to feel sorry for because he went into a wilderness place by himself. Right? So how many of you know when you go to a place by yourself and you complain, who are you going to complain to? You? God. That, that's about it. And pretty much just have, you know, bend to him. You know. Anyway, that's just a little side note there. And said, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I'm not better than my father's. And as he lay and slept under a juniper tree, behold, then an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals and a cruise of water at his head. And he did eat and drink and laid him down again. See, right there tells you, Baron, you'll be happy to know the cake <laughs> is something that God is blessing. Right? So, God endorses cake. That's a good thing. Alright. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for thee. And he arose and did eat and drink and went in the strength of that meat. Cake is meat. Forty days and forty nights unto Horeb, the mount of God. And came thither unto a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts and for the children of Israel, have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. So who's he talking to? Oh, God, right? And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by with a great and strong wind, rent the mountains, and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, the fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still small voice. And it was so when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in, entering, stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? <laughs> He cracks me up. He does. And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts. Because the children of Israel have forsaken my covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I even only, I only am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said unto him, Go return thy way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when thou comest, to Hazel to be king over, and anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of this other guy, shall thou anoint to be a prophet in thy room. And it shall come to pass that him that escapes the sword of Hazel shall Jehu slay, and of him that escapes from the sword of Jehu, shall Elisha slay. Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees of which have not bowed unto bow. 
and every mouth which has not kissed him. So he departed then and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him. And he with the twelfth that Elijah passed him. Oh, and Elisha was with the twelve oxen. And Elijah passed him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I'll follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered to him. All right, I know that's a lot. But really, if you want to find out a little bit about Elijah, I mean, chapter 17, 18, 19 is about where you're going to be at in this. To really get an idea of who he is and what God's called him to do. See, I've always been taught that Elijah was just one of those hard prophets. You know what I mean? Just one of those no-nonsense kind of guys. Because in the chapters previous, what did he do? He made fun of the other prophet or the other people and told them to, you know, go ahead and make their altar and they'll do their altar. And the God that answers the fire will be that. And he's like, is your God sleeping? And all that. And his first thing that he did was with the Tishbite, the widow woman whose son had died. And then, well, what did he tell her? He said, go make me some food, and then you can go die if you want to. Because what she had said was, I don't have enough for me and my son. We're just going to make enough to eat and die. So what we have isn't even enough to keep us alive. And then Elijah, Elijah was like, well, no, go ahead and make it for me. And then throughout the Bible, it seems like Elijah was always a hard prophet, right? And so I've always been taught that when he was calling out Elijah, or Elisha, yeah, that's kind of, that it was just being hard on him because that's the way you raise up a person of God. Is you're tough on them. And I've been in those ministries, I know you have too, to where they operate that way. You know, where it's like, man, let me make it tough on you just because you know what's going to happen, you know what's prepared for you, you know what it's going to take to get through it. And I'm just talking to the Lord about this, and, and I've always kind of said that Success without a successor is failure, right? If if everything stops with me, like if I were to die standing up here and this whole thing stopped, the school, all the children's ministry, the church, everything that we're doing, it stopped, then everything was a failure. Okay? So I was thinking, well, that's why God was doing this and raising him up. But then I started looking at this. And it's like, you know what? God didn't tell him to call a replacement until he just whined so much that he was in fear that he was so afraid that it's like, you know, I, you've gone as far as you can go. <laughs> so I need somebody else now to go from here. And so God told him to raise up somebody. So now you think about Elijah, knowing that he's being replaced, right? I mean, God said, you know, time to get somebody else. And then he's got to train his replacement. And at this time, I think he was probably maybe 60 years old, which during this time was pretty young. Of course, it's still pretty young now. 
That's close. I didn't say high or low. It's close, right? So he's not done with his life. He's not done with his ministry. And then God say, "Look, because you're a big one baby, it's time to raise somebody else up to take your place." So now I'm looking at this like, okay, he's going to find Elisha. Then he throws his mantle on him, or a mantle on him. And then Elisha's like, look, I didn't do this. I can buy my parents, you know, do all this kind of stuff. Make a sacrifice to the Lord. And so now when he says, what's that got to do with me? I'm not the one who called you. He's still whining and just kind of being a baby. Doesn't mean he's not a man of God. Okay? And also realize that Elisha did approximately twice of what Elijah did in his ministry. Now, does that mean Elijah <laughs> wasn't done? I don't know. But it kind of takes on a whole new meaning for me when I'm looking at why he did this because when you turn over to 2 Kings chapter 2 you find that Elisha is following him and Elijah is trying to tell him Go away, you bother. Is basically what he's saying. And then in verse 6, he says, I will not leave thee. And the two went on. And then in verse 8, it says, And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went up on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do to thee before I be taken from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. Why was that a hard thing? Huh? Because he'd gone through some stuff. Or could it be that he just thought he went through some stuff? Because if Elisha gets a double portion of the good stuff, does that mean he has to walk through twice of the bad stuff too? Because it's been my experience, you just can't take the good without the bad. It just doesn't work that way. So he's like, yeah, you've asked a hard thing. And he said, nevertheless, if thou see me when I'm taken from thee, it'll be so unto thee. But if not, it'll not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on to talk, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now you see what's happening here? They're walking together on this, and all of a sudden this chariot of fire splits them, separates them. Well, it's pretty cool to think about. And that's just one of those crazy things that we believe, isn't it? And Elisha saw it and cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof, and he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. And some people will say that your clothes back then represented who you were, represented your identity. So now he's taking his clothes and he's tearing them off. Representing his identity is no longer that of someone who's following or being trained under the prophet. That he's now taking on the identity of the prophet. And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. So you get this image that the whirlwind and the chariot takes him up and the mantle falls. And he picks it up. So what does this mantle represent? This cloth 
that he carried. It represents his anointing. It represents his authority. It represents his gifts and everything he is. That now he picks this up. Knowing that, okay, I saw this. So what's the expectation now? Double portion, right? So what's the first thing he does? Takes it out for a spin. If you get a, a new toy or something like that, don't you like to take it out for a spin and see what it'll do? It's no different when you get an anointing or a mantle thrust upon you. You want to take it out for a spin. When you first get saved, and then you find out who you are in Christ, and everything he's done for you and empowered you with, want to take you out for a spin? I mean, that's one of the things that when, when we've gone through various different circumstances here over the last you know, 12 years, and I always, uh, well, God, if you gave it, then man can't take it away. If you didn't give it, let him have it. But I'm not going to just walk away from it. How are you going to know? And over the years, we've had people challenge this. And I know in your lives, you've had people challenge who you are in Christ, right? You've had people challenge your authority. You've had people challenge your salvation. Because let's face it, like I said a minute ago, we believe some crazy stuff. We believe that a virgin carried a child and gave birth. Right? And then we believe that this child grew up to be a man named Jesus. Right? And he said he was the son of God. Right? He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. Why? Because God was with him. Okay. Then we believe that he was beaten and hung on the cross for our sins. Right? Died in place of us and that's not so crazy. But then three days later, rose from the dead. That's where it kind of gets to that little bit crazy side. And yet, without those foundational truths, we're not even saved, are we? I mean, that's kind of some of the basics of salvation. And then we believe <laughs> that he's coming back And then when we see him, we're going to be translated to be like him. <laughs> you got to realize how crazy that is <laughs> to someone that doesn't know him. And yet, that's what this Bible talks about. Everything I'm saying here is the basics of our salvation. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to be too late. And, you know, he's not taking up the first trip and the first load right now. So you don't have to worry about that. I mean, it's, but some of the things that this Bible talks about, we believe that God created everything. Right? We believe that this is his word and his spirit lives inside of us. So since we believe that, knowing some of the things that we're entitled to as ambassadors of him, doesn't the Bible say that we can lay hands on the sick and over heaven? Have you ever taken that gift out for a spin and see what it can do? It says that we're born again. 
and that we can lead other, others to Christ. And through that, they'll be born again. You know, this, this last week we were in the dining room, and it was somebody's birthday, one of the kids' birthday. And of course, they brought cupcakes, and, and I popped off and said, You know, I've been born twice. Remember that? And this young man, Josiah, he just kind of looked at him. Like, yeah, I was born once in the flesh by my mom. And then another time I was born in my spirit by Jesus. And he's like, what? And then all of a sudden, Gavin and John and somebody else. I can't remember who it was right now off the top of my head, but they're like, me too. And Josiah was like, I don't understand. And so I looked at John and said, you guys explain it to him. You know, explain to him how you can be born twice. Because that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. And in John 3 it says that you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. Isn't that cool? Yeah. And yet, isn't it a little crazy? Just a little bit. But I know that when I met Jesus, something different happened to me. Something I couldn't explain to anybody unless it happened to them. So I went about telling people what happened to me. And then I started looking in here and finding out why, how, how can I even understand this thing that's happened to me? How can I be different yet look the same? My nature changed because of that. So we go back to this. All that was for free, by the way. In verse 14, and, and he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted, and Elisha went over. And when the sons of the prophets, which were to view at Jericho, saw him, they said, The spirit of Elijah does rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves on the ground unto him. Now, Elijah didn't care about any of that. But can you imagine getting that man to him like, all right, I've got to check this out. So he takes it and hits the water. And the same thing happens. <coughs> and with us having Christ inside of us, if we'll do the things that he did, the same things will happen to the people around you that happen when Jesus touched you. Because you're an extension of him on this world. And I, I just don't understand why people have such a hard time with that. So turn, if you would, to the book of Luke, chapter 21. And then thinking about Elijah and how would he read, and I'm going to just talk so you guys can find it until I hear pages stop turning. See, that's not right. <laughs> then why was he running from Jezebel? He was afraid, right? He was afraid. And then Luke 21, verse 7. Everybody there? All right. And they asked him, saying, Master, but when shall these things be, and what sign will be, will there be when these things shall come to pass? And he said, Take heed that you be not deceived. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and the time draws near. Go ye not therefore after them. But when ye shall hear of wars and commotions, be not terrified. 
For these things must first come to pass. But the end is not by and by. The end is not yet. So Jesus is trying to address the people about you don't have to be afraid. Okay? There's nothing to be afraid of. If we believe what we believe, that, I mean, what, what, what happens when I die? I believe I stand before the Lord. I go to heaven. Pretty simple, right? Why? Because I know I've accepted Jesus as my personal Savior. I've asked Him to come into my life. And I've renounced my sins. Now, my expression of my faith might look different than yours or someone else's. But as long as we don't have the basics of Jesus, the rest of it doesn't really matter. I mean, there's churches out there that don't believe in musical instruments in the church. Okay, fine. We, we like them. Does that make us different? Only in that. There's churches out there that believe that their expression of modesty for the ladies is long dresses, no makeup, but the men can look like peacocks. That's all I said. <laughs> is there anything wrong with that? No. There, there's not. Because our basics of Jesus are the same. There's some that believe that you get sprinkled baptized. Some believe you get dunked. Some believe you don't have to do it at all. Some believe that you have to be baptized in Jesus' name. Some believe that you have to be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Some believe that unless you are baptized, you can't go to heaven. So if you get saved on your deathbed, but don't have time to get wet, oh, I'm sorry, wasn't any water around. Is that what the Bible teaches? No, it's not. So those different things that people believe, so what? As long as the basics are there. Mm -hmm. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead, and you'll be saved. That's what Romans says. For with the heart, you believe under righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It's really just that simple. Now, all these other things are cool, and they're available to you, and they're yours, whether you want them or not, whether you use them or not. How many people in here have a cell phone? Do you know every feature on that phone? No. 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 But is it all available to you? Yes, it is. If you don't know everything about it or use every feature, can you still communicate? Yeah. But when you learn something new, isn't it cool? And then you want to tell other people about it? Like every time the grandkids show her something that she didn't know on the phone, She's showing me how to do it. And then I've learned something new and then I can share it with other people. It's all available to you. Everything in here has been bought and paid for. It's all available to you. All you have to do is just do it. Believe it, trust it. And then take it out for a spin. Because I promise you, if I lay hands on you expecting God to heal you, I'm not the one expecting to heal you. So there's no pressure on me. And if you think that it didn't happen because of me, 
Well, that's not right either. Right? Anything that you do that's related to promises in this book, you're not the one that's going to see it come to pass. You're not the one God's expecting to make it happen. He said he would do it. Isn't that kind of liberating? Takes some pressure off. I mean, it does me. Because I don't have to perform in such a way where it's going to happen. All I got to do is what he said. You know, we were talking a couple weeks ago about calling for the elders of the church. Well, they called, but they, you guys were healed, weren't you? you? You felt better, right? Was there evidence of that? Did we do it? No. God did it. There wasn't anything that we could do or not do to keep God from doing it because they did what they were supposed to do. And then God said, okay, I'm going to honor my word. And he took care of it. And that's just one little thing. Well, probably didn't seem so little to you, did you? Then in verse 10, he says, Then sent he unto them, Nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and great earthquakes in diverse places, and famines, and pestilence, and fearful sights, and great signs there shall be from heaven. But before all these, they'll lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and the prisons, being brought before kings and rulers for, for my name's sake. And it shall turn to you for a testimony. Sound like that. What, what the enemy intended for evil, God intended it for good. So when things happen, don't look at what's happening. Look at the fact that God said it's going to turn to you for a testimony. We have been amazed and surprised about how easy it can be when you believe and trust God. We were, no, I'm not just saying this because you're here, brother. You know, that's, that's, but, you know, it kind of goes to what I'm talking about, but it was like the deal with DHS. We were expecting a lot more pushback, a lot more fallout from that. And I'm not saying they're done. That would be naive. But what we were surprised at was when they came with what they knew and someone stood up and said, this isn't right. This isn't even lawful. It's not even legal. You're not going to get out of here. But they left. That the police that they brought are the ones that told them they had to leave. And the last time they came, the police that they brought are the ones that wrote them the warning that if you come back, you're going to jail. And yet we keep wondering, how come the other churches don't stand up and do the same thing? It's like we took the sovereignty of God out for a spin, hit the ground and said, where is the God of us? Where is our God? And he said, I'm right here. Watch this. And that's what we're hoping through this documentary that Nick Coleman Television is doing. That gets across to people. Is look, if you will stand up and be who God called you to be. Look what will happen. And yet still, there's churches that aren't done yet. Mainly because you're not done yet and the world hasn't seen it yet. <laughs> We're working on that. 
But it's amazing how the body of Christ, how strong they can be if they've got nothing to lose. And the Bible says that we're dead in Christ, but nevertheless we live, right? And the life that we now live, we live after the faith of the Son of God, who gave himself for us. So if you're dead, what do they drag you with? Really? And guys, we're, we're coming into times right now that have become difficult for a lot of people. Gas is kind of expensive. Food, kind of expensive <laughs> and scarce. But it doesn't look like any of us are really going without that. Right. <laughs> just, I'm not judging, I'm just saying. <laughs> but knowing who you're going to knowing the promises that he's made you, he said that he would provide for you, right? All of your need. But you don't have to worry about stuff. That's right. We have him, plus we've got each other. And when I say each other, there are other churches and bodies of Christ out there that we'll be connecting to just out of sheer need and helping. And then we're sitting here. That's the way it was designed. So instead of division, now we have multiplication. Now we have a, a different avenue of unity. And that could be through lack. Isn't that something how that works out? All right. And then he says, verse 14, Settle it, therefore, in your hearts, not to meditate before what you'll answer. How many of you ever done that, rehearsed something? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because I know I did that a bunch. You know, these last five months, and okay, they come here, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do this, and I'll say this, and I'll say this. And then what actually happened, you're like, you guys aren't on my screen at all. <laughs> you know, there were things that came out of my mouth, like the first encounter, and I was like, bring him, but we, brought, we brought the police, good, you're going to need it. That was unexpected to come out of my mouth. But it was a statement of, Okay, it's going to take more than a threat to stop what God's doing. Oh, and i got to share something with you. Uh, last week, this young girl, Abigail, completely random. She's four years old? Yeah. Yeah, weighs every bit of 13 pounds. <laughs> you know, just random, had nothing to do with anything. said, I see the angels coming. And Jesus. And we're like, now? <laughs> you know, like, okay. Uh, this is for you. She hadn't been taught any of that stuff by you and you that I know of. But God's talking to these kids. And showing them things that they haven't either learned or unlearned yet. They're just calling out of what they see. And I remember I, when she said that, I started asking some questions. And then realized while I'm asking this four-year-old question, the nature of people who are just really good people like kids. And I realized that if I keep asking her questions, she's going to start using her imagination to answer some of these questions. She told me what she saw. That needs to be good enough. Anything beyond that is just, you, you kind of led them a little bit. So I just stopped and went, I'm, I'm good with that. You know, but when a four year old says, I see angels coming 
here. I mean here. And Jesus is with you. What do you do with that? You just feel like rejoice, like woohoo! That's right. Because I didn't tell him that. He showed it to us. Because we did. And like I said, I could, you know, that's just one example of it. These are the kinds of things that are happening with the kids. No wonder the devil hates them so much. Then verse 16, and you shall be betrayed both by parents and brethren and kin folks and friends, and some of you they'll cause to be put to death. And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But there shall not one hair on your head perish. In your patience, possession your souls. Now what's your soul? Your mind, your will, your emotion. And we should, when you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, and know that the desolation thereof is near. And let them which are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let them which are in the midst of it depart out. And let not them that are in the countries enter there too. For these be the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. And these are, this is Jesus' words. But woe to them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. For there shall be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people, and you'll not be able to find baby formula. <laughs> <laughs> and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive unto all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity the sea and waves roaring Here's something I want to really focus on here. Men's hearts fail in them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven will be shaken. And guys, you know what Jesus said. He said, when you see all these things, see to it that you're not troubled. You don't have to worry about it. All these things that are going on, I promise you, God's going to take care of you. He just is. He promised that. Will He use your neighbor and friend to do it? He might. But did He always? No. Remember when we were reading about Elijah? An angel came and made him some cake. It can happen that way, too. Remember 40 years of the children of Israel in the wilderness? They got manna from heaven. And even when they complained about that, God gave them quail. Which ain't a bad meal. And Jesus said, aren't you worth more than them? Aren't you worth more than the sparrows? Aren't you worth more than the lilies of the field? Aren't you worth more than all of that? Of course you are. That's a rhetorical question. Of course you are. As you see and hear all these different things, don't be troubled. Now that don't, like we talked about, doesn't mean it won't catch you off guard and you won't have a moment of woohoo, surprise. But don't let that moment of surprise turn into fear. Because really, you got nothing to be afraid of. I hope that helps somebody. Because right after that, it says, and then shall they, the people who are going through this, see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your head. 
for your redemption, Romans 10. Now that's not a bad promise, is it? But just realize in the midst of this, he didn't say that you're not going to see it. He just said, when you do, it's all right. And then there's that crazy thing we believe, that he's going to come back. And we're going to see him in the clouds. He's been alive for one of I was going to say dead, but rose again, so alive. That, that event happened, what, about 2,000 years ago? And we're still expecting that to happen. <laughs> and looking forward to it. I think so, too. And he spoke unto them a parable. Behold the fig tree. And what do they always leave out? And all other trees. People talk about the fig tree. But it also says you can pay attention to all the other trees too. Because here we don't have fig trees, do we? So how can we behold the fig tree? But he qualifies that. And all the trees. So when they start to shoot forth, you see that summer's at hand. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know you that the kingdom of God is near at hand. Truly I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my word shall not pass away. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that the day come upon you unaware. For as a snare shall come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch you therefore pray always that you may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now, this is something I just want to throw this out there. I understand the, the, the desire as a Christian to be humble. Okay? I understand to put that humility out there that just means an absence of pride. Okay? That we'll humble ourselves so we'll be able to serve others. Okay? I get that. I embrace that. But here, what's he saying? I hear people say, I'm not worthy. But Jesus is telling you right here, watch and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape this stuff. So, how can you pray and talk to God and say, I'm not worthy when he's telling you you are worthy and you need to count yourself as worthy. So you are worthy. You are worthy. Not in yourself, but because who he is inside of you. Okay? I said, I understand the how it's put out there. And by saying that, it makes you maybe sound more humble or feel more humble. But Jesus said, pray that you be counted worthy. So if you're praying to be counted worthy, you've got to change your mindset from an unworthy worm to someone who's worthy of being rescued. To escape all these things that should come to pass. And to stand before the Son of Man. And in the daytime he was teaching in the temple. And at night he went out and abode in the Mount of Mount Colossus. And all the people came in early in the morning. To him in the temple. To hear him. Oh, I do have time for this. Revelations chapter 21. 
Now this, where we're, while you're finding this, and it will be put up on the screen for you, I want you to realize what's happened here on the earth. I mean, the tribulation's already come and gone. There's a new heaven and a new earth here, okay? Because the old one's been passed away by this time. So a context of timing on this, this isn't during the tribulation. This isn't after the tribulation. This is after even the millennium. If you read it. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1. And he says, And I saw a new heaven and new earth. Because remember he said, Heaven and earth will not pass away, or it will pass away before any of my words did. For the first earth was passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away, and he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, It's done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that thirst of the fountain of water of life freely. He that overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God and he will be my son. And then here's the part that kind of sucks. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part of the lake which burns with fire and brimstone which is the second death. <sighs> Guys, you don't have to be afraid of nothing. Because we all know that scripture, God didn't give us spirit of fear. But what did he give us? Power, power love, and sound mind. Exactly. See, that's the word. So instead of, like I've said before, focusing on what he didn't give you, Focus on what he did give you. He didn't give you fear, so why even bother with that? What did he give you? Power, love, and a sound mind. So as all these things happen, and you see fear, you just realize, that ain't God. And I've heard people say, in an accurate fear, false evidence, appearing real. Well, it feels pretty darn real, doesn't it? Or <laughs> the one for COVID, oh, which I say COVID, I guess this video will be flagged now. So, is faith over fear as people close down churches and pastors hid from their people? And as people just got scared to go anywhere and do anything? And yet, they had a yard sign that said, Faith over fear. Guys, <laughs> get it out of the yard and get it into you. Anyway, that's kind of what time allows me to do for now. And I am working on a teaching about the new heaven, the new earth, and about how the pressure that people are under. And what they're experiencing and how it applies to them. But that'll come later. Maybe I'm working on it. Doesn't mean I'm going to be a sheriff with everybody. You know, sometimes I'm working on those things and God says, that ah, is for you. And that's okay for you. Oh, Father, I thank you for your people who are called by your name. Thank <laughs> God. I love you. Thank you. For being a father to us and to all who seek you. God bless your people. 
all the people on this planet. Let them know that you're right there. In the whisper of heaven's voice, that we know you. Lord, we thank you. Amen. All right. And the last thing, on the count of three, what do we do? Right, so ready? One, two, three. I love this place.